He performs his caustic, cranky, bile-spewing, dead-on comedy at clubs throughout Europe and America and has received considerable critical acclaim. He's starred on Broadway and been seen in films like Hannah and Her Sisters and Jacob's Ladder. But audiences know him best for his scathing political and social commentary on Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up next on Interviews, our conversation with the winner of the American Comedy Awards Funniest Male Stand-Up Comic, Louis Black. What do you think is the definition of funny? What's, what, what, what is the definition of funny is uh, anything that makes uh, anyone laugh. Funny is, com- uh, funny is completely subjective. So that I can laugh at something and, you, you, and the same thing will make you laugh, but it's still funny. It's whatever's funny to you. Can you, when you're thinking of an idea, when you're thinking of a joke, can you tell if it's going to work with an audience yet at your career? Or is it still trial and error when you get out there? It's, it gets better, but it's still, you still, you know, it's like a tree falling in the forest. If nobody's there, it's, yeah. you have no idea, you know. I'm never good with, I'm certainly never good with uh, when, when other comics ask me for advice and they'll say something and I really laugh. And then, <laughs> because I'm, I've got a more twisted sense of humor and then they'll, they'll do it and, Nobody will. I'll be the one laughing. So. Are there limits? Are there things that you know you can't cross? Is there something that people are just never going to find funny? And if so, are those challenges to you? Well, they are challenges. You think about them. The Holocaust comes to the... That's number one, I think. That one, uh, you know, you, you haven't heard the really great Holocaust joke. No one has really conquered that. So you kind of, you, you know, you always kind of think about it. And uh, uh, the, the other, the toughest nut to crack is abortion. I don't know how you deal with that. Yeah. The guys have tried. There's, there are a couple of guys who do uh, stuff on it. I have, that eludes me because it's such a flat, you, literally the audience, you might as well just uh, throw gasoline on the audience and, and then uh, light a match because yeah. everybody, it's immediate, immediately people take sides. There's no, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to find that common ground for a joke there. Does it upset when you upset you when people think you're either liberal or, in a sense, conservative? Or does that? Anger yeah, it upsets me because they don't know. Um, I mean, uh, I, I've made certain statements about what I am, but they don't. From watching my act, nobody you, nobody knows. Can't call it liberal or conservative. It's 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 ridiculous. It's really ridiculous yeah. to uh, to take what a comic you know because a comic can do whatever he wants on stage. You can't then. Say that's what the person is, so it, it irritates me, and it's what they think, and it's like you know, and it's it, that whole thing with the word liberal anyway, which they've just kind of soiled the word, so uh, it just it's irritating, it's and it's used it's because it's it's mainly thrown out as an epithet, mm-hmm. you know, and they will. I mean, I, guys will say they say you know, uh, I, you know, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I know you're a liberal, but I still like you. Well, you know, <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. You're still funny. So that, that does. And because I basically have spent most of my, uh, my public career, I mean, I spent a long time doing this, but my, where I'm in public, where I don't, it's just who's ever in charge. Yeah. You know, it's like the thing about The Daily Show. They go, oh, well, you know, that, you know you're kind of a, you know, that show is kind of a, a, a liberal show. And it's, it's who's in charge. It's, not, it's anti-authority or anti-authoritarian. When you look at your audience and the growing popularity you have lately, what does that tell you about the way the community is seeing you, the way people are seeing you? What do you learn about where we are? Well, the weirdest thing is the amount of families that come to see me. Really? I have a huge, I think really large, shockingly so. I mean, it shocks me. I have uh, parents and kids in Houston. I had it uh, at the last stop. One of the one of the, the first times it ever happened, fought, the guy comes up with three generations. It was a grandfather and a father and a son, and <laughs> and that I think uh, undermines in somewhat the case 
that is constantly presented to the fatigue and exhaustion of those of us who don't have families, family values. Because uh, if that's the case, what are they doing coming to see me? Right. You know, I, I'm an odd choice as a family value comic. And I'm told constantly, this is, I'll go, you know, the, I'll, I'll, there'll be a parent there with a 15-year-old, and they'll say, you know, it's, it's nice of you to come. And, they, and both of them will say, well, this is the only thing we enjoy doing together. So I'm, I'm very proud of it, but I think it really puts, I think that um, to say we're, where we are to try to push us into this kind of, uh, you know, as a country to say, you know, well, we, we really, you know, this family value thing is important. It's ludicrous. There, there are families, and those families have certain values, and sometimes they don't overlap. Yeah. doesn't mean that, you know, if a father and a son or a mother and a father and a kid are coming to see me work together, then it's as good as if they went to church together. I'm not saying I'm a priest, so let's not <laughs> go crazy out there. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a communal activity that's important. And that's what a family is about, is finding in, in those kind of activities. And they don't all have to be church-centered. Okay? Did you hear me? <laughs> you can go to a movie together, and the movie the movie can have some bad words in it. And you know what? It's everything's going to be okay because the family's together. It's just that's the thing that really. Yeah. But that's the one thing I think I've learned from, because it surprised me. Yeah. You know, I would have thought, you know, and on paper it looks as if my audience would be all kids, mm-hmm. and it's not. Yeah. Well, what surprises me about it, and I think that maybe there's something here, is the fact that what you speak for more so than either side is common sense. You know, you're, you're getting outraged because things are ridiculous. The things they're doing don't make sense. And as people flock to you for that, I would think in some way that gives hope that people are waking up to that message in general. And maybe they're going to start thinking about that when their pol- politicians are speaking. Maybe they're going to start looking for some common sense. Well, I hope so. I mean, that's really, but that's the center of the act. It's, yeah. Is uh, is my uh, frustration with our lack of it, yeah, and especially among the leadership, which just seems to be oblivious. Would you say in recent years it's gotten worse, or we're just paying more attention to it? I think. Well, we got. Well, here's the thing. We I think we're paying more attention to it because there's more um, uh, information. But with more information, uh, there's also less common sense across the board <laughs> because the people we're getting the information from aren't really good at what they're doing <laughs> a lot of the time, too. Uh, I, think, um, I think we're more aware of it, and I think uh, that, um, you know, I hope so. I mean, it's, you know, this concept, I mean, there has to be a certain awareness of it. I mean, we're, you know, I mean, why are we at 50-50 as a country, even though, Many people think that we're not at 50-50, but if you look at the numbers on pretty much any given issue, it's 50-50. And the reason is is because um, half the people kind of agree with one side and half the people kind of agree with the other side. And there's nobody who really can present it mm-hmm. uh, in a way in which, uh, you know, in which shows that kind of, uh, um, it's, it shows a certain degree of, of well, common sense. Yeah. Why do you think you have this insight? Uh, I don't. I don't really know. I don't think I really have it. I just think. <laughs> I think that I just. I'm taking a shot. You know, <laughs> is it something you believe people... in, or is it just lines that are coming to you? Oh no, this is something. I. I you know, I have a certain passion, but but I don't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't think a comic can be a crusader. Uh, uh, I did that. I mean, I worked in. Uh, you know, I. I worked for a long time trying. I had a. A theater that was working in a high school, working in a, uh, um, a uh, in the prisons, working at Air Force Army bases. I had a you know a theater company, a whole group of, and we were all kids, and we went you know to every possible community, did every possible community type of service we could do, and uh, um, and there I think I was really kind of doing that kind of you know I was actually really doing something I think all I'm, I'm really the ultimate thing is is you got to make people laugh you have to be entertaining people as soon as you as soon as you uh, cross that line to thinking that you're really 
you have a message, then you know, then you then you're moving into the Huey Long thing. Right, right. <laughs> Now, you went to Yale, correct? The drama school, which right. is kind of sissy. Yale is hard, <laughs> drama sissy. <Yeah. laughs> you didn't have the best things in the world to say about that whole experience. No, I didn't. No. Why? Uh, well, I went to, uh, I, I ended up going to drama school, uh, and, you know, yeah, yeah, I don't mean to equate it, but in the sense of, the, it, with the kind of innocence that uh, my generation went to, went and, and, and fought in Vietnam. It was like, oh, this would be great. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, this will be a supportive situation. These people think I'm a good writer. Uh, I'll be with other good writers and other talented individuals who want to make a living in the theater. And uh, this should be. And I wanted to teach. And uh, and I got there, and uh, it was uh, um, it was a brutal. It was it was kind of a brutal situation in a lot of ways. I mean, I look back in retrospect. You know, it's certainly not like, you know. Uh, you know, having to work in a sweat box in, in the uh, 30s in New York City and, <laughs> right. you know, and, yeah. and sewing for 15 hours a day. But in terms of your mentally, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you know, having your, you know, bringing your, uh, your, your somewhat, your, your intellect, whatever, but, you know, smidge, you have an, have an intellect to the table and just having them take a hammer and pound on it all day was, it was ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, and I've, I've always felt this, uh, you know, at least in terms of watching people who, in the, the art school situation, uh, and I think it covers all of them, is the fact that, you know, if, you, if you're going to have a school that's training people to go out and do this, then those people should be, as, once they accept you, um, then they have to be, uh, as, as much as they can try to create a discipline for you and give a sense of, what your craft is, they also have to leave you a real base of strength. And, and that was not the case there. They, uh, people were said, things were said to people that were beyond belief. You don't, you don't after somebody graduates after three years, say to them, you know, you know I don't think uh, this is going to work out for you. A person just put three years of their life into this. Yeah. But don't you find that with management across the board, too, in so many different areas that they lift us up to knock us down, that they, they accept you to change you, that people aren't willing to nurture what you are, they have their own mindset, and it doesn't matter? Well, I mean, I, I've kind of avoided that, that situation, but I think that's probably the case. I mean, you know, I don't think we do know how to. We're not a, for some reason, we're, we, we don't seem to have that, you know, we don't know how to lead, we don't know how to nurture, you right. know. Well, we maybe, need help. What makes me think about that is I know that there's been talk about what they're going to do with you on television, sitcoms, development deals, and all that, mm -hmm. and that's just a whole other circus, I would assume, you know? Yeah, but the difference in that circus is they pay you a lot of money <laughs> while they're screwing you. Yeah. So the hooker concept, yeah. you know, even though you may feel like a hooker, you know, the, at least there's some money. The thing with theater is, is you're, a, you're kind of a $20 hooker. <laughs> so you know, they don't even pay you well. They don't even pay you. They don't. They basically, they ask you for a twenty, and will you still hook? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the pimp is like the theater's a crazy little pimp, but uh, television, they at least kind of, they do. I mean, they at least, you know, and a lot of guys I know. I mean, Ted Talley, uh, who wrote Silence of the Lambs, wrote 20, 20 film scripts, I think, or something. I, 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 I but a lot. I mean, I know pretty much because it was he'd written some really fine plays. He'd been known as an author, and I, it, it must have been, because it wasn't, whenever Silence of the Lambs must have been in the late 80s, came out, you know, you realize he'd been out of school writing, you know, scripts for probably seven, eight years. I don't know how many scripts he wrote. You know, you know, and they'd pay him for the scripts. They'd never do the scripts. <laughs> now, but when you left, you also went into the theater, and you were writing plays, and plays got produced, and one even got turned into a film, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, one eventually, a small play, a yeah. little, a one-act play. But so, when did you decide, I don't want this, I'm going to go comedy? Uh, here's the great Houston story. <laughs> it all comes back to Houston. I was, it was here. The end of the universe. It was, yeah. It's a lot of, I spent, uh, uh, I, I had a play produced at the Alley Theater. And uh, it was called The Czar of Rock and Roll. It was written with my friend Rusty McGee. And I saw that uh, as our, f for him and I, because he was, uh, really wanted to be, write musicals and I was writing plays and, I saw this as our kind of break. We finally got into a regional theater. I'd, I'd had my plays done a lot of places, but not something in the stature of the alley. 
the, the, we were downstairs, we were doing a workshop production, a workshop production. The idea of a workshop production in theater is, is you do this, perform it, um, and you, because this, we were taking a piece that basically went 75 minutes and expanding it um, to a two, to, to a, to a two act piece. That we, we were really doing down there was experimenting. Yeah. And the concept has to be that, you know, the writer stays around, and if Rusty was not married with a child at the time, both of us would stay around and work on it. But I would be there. I would work on it. Well, then, um, we, uh, we, I, so I say to them, <clears throat> you know, after about a, you know, a few weeks that I'm there, you know, are we going to be able to, uh, to uh, where am I going to stay? Well, we're not going to be able to put you up anywhere. <laughs> well, that was, and I'm not even asking for, I'm not asking for money. Yeah. I'm not asking for any money. I'm just saying, I'm just asking for the place that I thought I could stay at. I mean, I'm going broke doing this. Um, it did not matter what went down in that basement theater. They could have had us. They could have had um, played classical music and had rats run around in front of the audience. As long as there was something going on down there so that they could get a grant from the Hoo-Ha Corporation so that you know they could continue to fund what it is that they want to do. I, I decide, um, at that point I've been doing stand-up, I've been... Uh, I've been doing stand-up more and more and more. As it, it just really had become more comfortable with it. Was it had uh, toured for a month with a friend of mine, um, and begun to do touring. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I'll go over. There's a club called Spellbinders. I'll go over there, and that way I might be able to get to come back here while the play is running, and I'll get to see. At least if I don't see it, I'll see some of the final some performances after they've had time to work on it. And then we'll uh, and we'll see if we can do that. So I go to Spellbinders. I do a 15-minute set of comedy. The, they happen to have. I was lucky. They had a, a fallout in their schedule. They booked me immediately to come back in four weeks. <laughs> I would get to see the play, um, and they gave me a nicer place to stay, more money for one week's work than I made um, for writing this play that had now was in its sixth year. I'm working on this play, <laughs> and uh, and a better car. That we, I didn't have to rent the car. They gave me the car. And I, and I literally looked and went, well, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> and so, and you know. comedy had you. And then that was it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's like literally, you know, it's, you know, you want door number one. Here, you can walk through door number one, and there's a clown that's going to punch you in the face. So you can walk through door number two, and, and, uh, and, and you know, and it's, it's a quiet, peaceful, pastoral setting. And, yeah. and someone will put grapes in your mouth. And I thought, <laughs> how odd is it that the people... Uh, and it really is. I find it, uh, it, it you know, I still, you know, there's, I just carry a residue of anger about the fact that, you know, I did what, you know, you, is, you know, you kind of go. that's all gone now, though, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can tell. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the few things. I don't get angry about a lot of things real in, I've, I've let go of a lot of stuff. Thing, yeah. You know, things are good. You can't really, but boy. Boy, if this, the this right one, one huh? This is the one. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's like, you know, it's, you do the work, you go to the drama school. You write the plays, you put in the time, you do the thing. I, write, I run a theater for crying out loud. I, you know, uh, I do all of this stuff in order to prepare me to work at a major regional theater. I've done, I've done as much time, hard time, as the rest of the gang. And I get, um, and, I, and, and yet they treat me, uh, you know, in, like an abusive alcoholic father. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile... The, the real alcoholic who runs the club <laughs> treats me in a really in a way in which I would have expected the theater community to, to, to treat me. And I thought, wow, you know what? Uh, I'd rather be treated. Uh, I'd rather be treated nicely. I'm tired of being treated like that. Yeah. And uh, I've 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 gone back and done some theater, but that was. When was Hannah and her sisters? When does that fall into all of this? After that? No, that falls in before it. You know. Woody needed his career turned around. I had some time. <laughs> so I decided to help him out. <laughs> yeah, it came before it in the uh, early 80s. Yeah. And Rusty's in that, actually. My friend who I wrote with, he's, in, he's one of the guys. He's, he's the one playing the kind of the John Belushi guy who's throwing up in the company that, you know, he did, Woody is supposedly writing for Saturday Night Live, and Rusty has a scene. It's in a remarkable... The scene that I'm in, the first scene that I'm in is remarkable because in that scene is... And none of them had done... Much in movies was John Turturro, J.T. Walsh, Julie Kavner, who'd been working with him, uh, 
Julie Louise Dreyfus. That was the first real big thing I think outside of Saturday Night Live. She was, I think it made me her first film, me, um, uh, and and a couple of others. It was it's unbelievable with all these little short vignettes. Yeah, is Woody Allen a genius? Oh yeah, 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 yeah he is. Did he see something in all of you? Because when you go through a list like that, and it's all early on in pretty much all of his careers. Uh, Juliet Taylor is a genius too. Yeah. His casting person is really pretty brilliant. I've never seen anybody. She had, you know, if you go back and look at her movies, she had, she caught everybody before they took off. Right. She had a real f uh, sense of it and a, a real finger on the pulse. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. How come you don't do more of it? Because I have a lousy agent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's terrible. But uh, I actually like my agent now. Um, I just don't. I don't know. I think part of it was is that I'd done a bunch, and I don't know what happened. Uh, but I was touring more, and so I didn't have the time. Uh, and also, there was a, there was kind of a turn in the film thing where they uh, those movies, um, you know, the ones I was getting in, kind of became. The economics became bigger and bigger. The parts that I might get, if I was to grow beyond where I was, were the parts that, well, you know, it's like even now, it's like they'll call and go, well, they're really interested for you, this movie. Really? You know, this is, you know, what do you think? You got a 10-day commitment, da 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 Sure, I'll do the movie. Great. And then it's, well, Eugene Levy's going to do it. Uh, so what are you going to do? You can't argue. Yeah. You know, I would pick Eugene Levy over me. Yeah. I got no problem with that. <laughs> can I? Can I go up there? I watch. I'd like to watch Eugene Levy work for ten days. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that may be something yeah. to do with it. Well, one thing he couldn't do is the Daily Show. No. So, how have you been enjoying that? That's great. Yeah. That's really fun. Why do you think you've lasted the nine years? Because they all owe me. Uh, <laughs> every one of them owes me money. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one who kept it going. It yeah, was all out of pocket. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I was so broke when I started that. Um, it, it, the show has lasted, why well, you think the show's lasted nine well, years? How or you've, I, how, you've I, lasted through... Well, because I, I think um, I'm, I've just got such a different voice from everybody, and it's the kind of... There's no co real formal commentator on the show. I've kind of ended up in that position when I was initially picked, Liz Winstead. Had me come in. I just sat behind a desk and yelled about stuff. <laughs> the first, we were the first when Kilborn started with us. We, we, I literally did. We did it without an audience, and I was smoking <laughs> cigarettes, <laughs> and the, and I could smoke while I was doing it. It was great, you know. Yeah. And then, and then eventually I quit smoking, and then I did two whole things where I talked about nothing, except the fact that I had nothing to say because I quit smoking, and came up with the thought, said that if, if. Um, you know, if Hitler came into the room with a carton, I would follow him to the Sudetenland, <laughs> stuff like that. And then that kind of evolved more and more, and I thought, we were doing that for about a year, year and a half, and I said, you know, we have all this footage coming in, um, and what I really wanted to do, I did something I never did, which is network. You know, I, I went in, I went, I actually went to the party and talked yeah. to everybody. Well, and while they were all kind of drunk, um, <laughs> I said, I proposed that... Uh, what I wanted to do was do two and a half minutes at the end of the week where I would kind of summarize uh, on a Thursday mm -hmm. uh, everything that had gone on. And just like it could be t anything from, you know, it might be something might get 20 seconds, something might get t 10 seconds, 5 seconds. You know, just point out, you know, look and look at him and da-da-da. And, uh, and that became, that my idea in, uh, in, the, in the network is the, is the drinking Moved along. My my idea was it's like uh, became back and became back in black. One of the guys, one of the producers said it. Well, we'll call it back in black. And then what they did was is they started taking footage that they weren't using because they were inundated with footage, uh -huh. and and dropped it on us. And then we would figure out what to do yeah. with it and put it together into a, a a segment. And I think that's possibly. And I don't want to get too technical here, but how do you write those segments? How does that happen? What's the process? Well, there? it used to be uh, that I wrote more of it. I mean, I used to was totally involved in it before the before um, uh, I before this this thing took off. Before my career actually kind of took off, I was uh, we would go in uh, producer. We had a producer and uh, two writers and myself, and for like th two, three must be three years, we would sit in a room every week and watch one. You know. 
you know, the, you know, a, a squirrel on skis, the whole thing, you know, <laughs> one piece of madness after another. And we pick out and make jokes. Right. And, and they were really good at writing jokes. I don't really write jokes on the spot. I'm, I don't have that facility. I can kind of do it. I, I can do it if, I can really do it if a comic has something. Has, if I can watch a comic work, I can help a comic fix a joke or reconstruct it. But I, I'm not a joke. I don't have that. Uh, I think that's a real craft. I was I was playwriting, and that is that you don't do that in playwriting. You don't <laughs> that skill. But I mean, seriously, I think that I lost that muscle, in fact, because I was I didn't put that time in. But these guys, I worked with really good, and then I take it downstairs and collate it and put it together and tell uh, in a way in which I thought you know I made sense to do it, and, you know, with my you know and uh, and how to do it, and then I would. Uh, write out the thing, so it was like two, three minutes long. I'd hand it to Hank, the producer. He would then put it together with the footage, with, uh, there would be a, you know, one of the guys from the, one of the film editors there. They would do that. Then it would come back after they had clipped it up. Then I would do a little more, more of it. We'd hand it back to the writers. The writers <laughs> would then punch it up again. And then we'd do it. And it was really not a long process. It was like probably three hours, four hours probably. I mean, whatever it was in terms of the, the film editing, I don't know. But the basic writing and editing of it was yeah. three to four hours. And uh, and then we just, you know, present it. And I was like kind of a, I was like the Vatican City there, is because I was the, I was like uh, uh, under myself. Nobody, they, we, they would just put it on. Yeah. You know, they, they would look at it, might have some ideas, but basically they would just do it. And, and for anyone to find out how they do it now, they're going to have to find out another way because we are out of time. Is that right? Yeah, we've gone. We're done. No. Yeah, so all I can say is that thank was unbelievable. you for not slipping through the cracks. <laughs> Lewis Black, thank, thank you. Thank you. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Music.